And if I rotate the magnet like this, we're kind of getting a cross section of the magnetic field. Let me move it around like that. This one here, you see, you can move the magnetic filings. Oh man, that's awesome. Look at that. And this is a demonstration of the, the magnetic fields that are invisible to our eye, but exist. all around us. So we got sent this kit a few months ago and I can't agree more with this uh, tagline here, learning by doing. It's really amazing how much of our world and our everyday experience is governed by the electrons in their movement, in their exchange of energy and momentum uh, among each other, surrounding the atomic nucleus. You know, we have a whole zoo of particles in the quantum domain, but the photon and the electron, and the interactions between them, and the electromagnetic field that is... characteristic of them is the bulk of what any given humans, maybe other than scientists, uh, physical experience, day-to-day -day experience m makes up. You know, the photons coming off, creating the light that we're seeing from this flame here, is just the breaking, the injection of energy into the chemical bonds of oxygen, uh, atmospheric oxygen, O2, so two oxygen molecules, and when they interact, um, I guess the wax interacting with the oxygen in the atmosphere creates, fuses hydrogen to the oxygen to make H2O. So the breakup of the chemical bonds between the atoms in the subsequent combination of them uh, to make different chem molecules creates photons by the change in the valences of the electrons around those atoms and as they jump up they're receiving energy and they always have a tendency to drop back down to a lower energy state if there's available positions in the lower, uh, more preferable energy state, and when they drop back down, they release energy, they release momentum in these massless, extremely fast particles called photons, and uh, chargeless too, photons don't have a charge, unlike the electrons that although there are other particles that do carry charges, um, the electrons are what make up electric charge as most people think about it. So we're going to crack this box open. It may, and it's got a ton of experiments, so maybe we'll uh, make this a recurring series. LOL. It's ages 8 and up, so I think that uh, qualifies us to break into it. Try to keep it in, in the light here, so you guys can see what's going on. here experiment manual thinking observing questioning experimenting and by the way shout out to Justin for buying this for us 
I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. This is... I'm not sure if I had it on my Amazon wish list, but um, I, d I did have a P.O. box until just recently, as of the date of this video. But the... I don't know if it's because of inflation or whatnot. The P.O. box went... Uh, it about doubled, doubled in its annual price, so I honestly just couldn't afford it anymore. So I had to cancel that. But anyways... I didn't want to encourage anybody to send gifts into the channel. Um, if there, I tried to wipe the P.O. box from most of the video descriptions, but uh, just in case you stumble upon it, it's uh, no longer active. But I wanted to thank Justin for this. This is really, really cool. I think I had it, like I said, on my Amazon wish list, and I think I had a. Or, or still have a chemical set too, which I thought would be super cool. You know, between the, the sounds and the fizzing and all the uh, chemical liquid solutions. Um, just to do little basic experiments. Generating heat and byproducts and mixing solutions. And I thought that might be cool. So, before we take a, a closer look... At the manual, I guess, is what I'm talking about. We are... Uh, let's look at what we have here. Take a little inventory. So, what's interesting about the... The creation of electricity, as we typically see it, in putting a, a potential energy across metal any type of metal, is that metal atoms, generally the nature of metal that creates, that makes it conductive, instead of insulative, like this cardboard box here, um, what makes things conductive is that the outermost layer, or the most, they're kind of the most fickle positions of electrons, are almost share, well no, I think they do share electrons among the metal atoms. And the fact that it's kind of like a, I've heard it described as like an electron soup going across um, throughout the wire. So the reason electrons can distribute energy so efficiently in wire, and the reason wire and metal uh, heats up is just gonna focus. Maybe I gotta keep it that far away. The reason wire heats up so easily and gets cold so easily and um, accepts electric charge is that the electrons very readily um, exchange. They're kind of in a soup. And the outermost electrons of the metal atoms exchange energy across each other. So they transmit it in the way those those pendulum balls, you think, um, I think it was it called Newton's pendulum, where they don't even really move. They just translate the energy. So their position doesn't translate, but the ball on either end um, translates its momentum through the balls, the uh, middle balls, and knocks the ball at the other end, um, gives it movement, and translates its position. Um, and so it's uh, interesting that the, the electrons themselves don't actually move very far or, or fast, even when an electric current is flowing. Electric current being the flow, uh, the particular flow of energy, fl particular number of charges passing a certain cross-section of uh, wire at any given moment. And uh, so the electrons don't even really move all that much relative to the speed of the, the actual charges flowing through uh, for any given current. Um, and so I, it, it's interesting that it's uh, more of a, more of a, um, a, a, 
flow of energy. Electricity is a flow of energy more than a flow of the actual electrons themselves. It's the energy given by the, um, or transmitted by the electrons. So here we have like a simple switch. This is where uh, you can close the circuit. Let's see if I can show you in there. It, the metal gets cinched between these two metal pieces, this metal lever, and that closes the circuit. And we have two wires that will come off that right there. And uh, we have a lot of these little terminals here that are just easy ways to make, uh, to you know, pop the wires in place. We have AA batteries, which I didn't get any, so maybe I'll have to find that. That's our power source. Unless there's a hand crank around here, which I feel like there might be in this kit. Here's a cool little motor. And what's interesting about motors is that they take advantage, generators, motors, electric motors, they take advantage of the fact that when you run, if you have looped wire, and you run an electric current through it, that induces a magnetic field. I'm trying to find loops. Um, and because, because magnets can move metal or hold it in place, they, uh, let me hold it so I can just move this around. Yeah. Um, when you configure the electric current running through looped wire into you know, a different arrangement. Oh, here we go. It's right in front of me. If you configure it into a solenoid, I think it's called, when it's just looped into uh, a cylinder, or configure, I guess, maybe it's it's more complex than that. I think it's there's like nodes of looped wire, but essentially you um, you create a moving magnetic field so that as you inject energy into, uh, or as you induce a current, it moves, you know, can move an actual gear and the motor can do work. It can turn wheels and make cars and objects spin and move. And uh, so it's interesting that magnetic induction, you know, moves moves uh, things around, and you can induce magnetic induction by running current in a certain through a certain geometry, a certain shape of wires. Yeah, I wonder, here we go. So we got iron filings right here. This is a really cool way to see the electric field. Oh, can you guys see that? Let's put our line a little closer. Okay. Here we go, we can see. Let's, well, let me make sure it's in focus. Half my phone's covered by the actual phone holder clamp. So that's why sometimes my videos are out of focus and I don't even realize it. But yeah, look at... Maybe it's this side a little better. But the iron filings or whatever filings these are, are completely immediately affected. by the magnetic field in this magnet here. That's probably too close. Maybe that's better. And if I rotate the magnet like this, we're kind of getting a cross-section of the magnetic field. 
as it changes its position. How amazing is that? That's so cool. Hope it's not reflecting too much there. Maybe I do like that. That's just awesome. Let me move it around like that. This one here, you see. You can move the magnetic filings. Oh man, that's awesome. Look at that. And this is a demonstration of the the magnetic fields that are invisible to our eye, but exist all around us. So, that's how the compasses work. We are protected by Earth's magnetic field, which funnels all the solar uh, potentially harmful solar radiation right into the poles of the earth and creates those beautiful auroras when that energy strikes the nitrogen and oxygen molecules in earth's atmosphere okay that's too much fun but it doesn't show doesn't demonstrate too much There we go, there's a... Can't really demonstrate the force I'm feeling here, but um, there is a force. I guess I'm a little confused at the, the shape of the magnetic field for this. There's a repulsion, repulsion, and then attraction. So it's like this side is attractive, this side is repulsive, but now if I rotate it, at what point does it become attractive? Wow, that's really weird. The whole thing is repulsive now. What's going on here? Well, maybe our little lab guide over here will illuminate that for us but electric motors are really cool I just uh, you know it's hundreds of years old we're still using them more and more now with electric cars and um, it's like roughly the same technology it's the battery the chemical battery technology that's actually the um, evolving an improving uh, part of the electric car or electric, you know, any electric motor system. I actually heard, I heard someone say that, uh, you know, Tesla, more than anything, obviously this is an oversimplification, but there is a grain of truth in it, is a battery company more than a car company because they have to, they create, they invent, they they design and manufacture their own batteries in-house in all their massive factories. And those batteries, of course, the selling point is um, what's going to send the automobile economy over the tipping point to transfer from gas, you know, internal combustion engines to electric cars is going to be the efficiency of the batteries and how far you can go, the range of the cars. Here's a little gear system here. It's a ratio down so that you spin this one a lot and you get a small movement from that one. Or conversely, you can make this one spin fast, this one's gonna spin much faster. Um, we have a little measuring device here. It measures the current. Plug in the leads there. We have a, a bell. It's probably not something we're going to do. A voltmeter. So it's an ammeter for amperes. A voltmeter for measuring volts. 
goes up to 15 volts there. I have to figure out how to read that. Is that a multiplication? Oh, no, that's no. It's an addition sign. Okay. So I guess there is probably different settings. If you have it on the lower setting, it measures just between negative 1 and and 3 volts. And then if you have it on the larger setting, maybe a you adjust it with this right here, possibly. It's going to go from negative 5 to 15 right there. And this one's the same. You have, uh, oh, I guess you plug it in according to the, the, the higher, you know, the, the range of resolution you want to have. This goes from 0.2, negative 0.2 to positive 0.6 amps. Or negative 1 to 3 amps, which is actually kind of a lot. Most electronics, I think, operate at less than an, an amp. 2 to 500 milliamps, I think. I think that might be a safe generalization to make. It even gives you a little screwdriver, too. No Phillips head. I don't know what other people call it in other countries. We call it a Phillips head. Over here. Over yonder. Or hither. So we have connectors. Another switch. We have a, like a really manual resistor. And this is interesting because it, uh, the, one of the fundamental equations of electricity and, and studying currents is that the voltage of any given system is going to always equal the current multiplied by the resistance found in that current. And the more wire you have, the more, you know, the simplest form of a resistor is that the, the more wire you have, the more resistance that current is going to feel. Just like the longer a, a hose is, the more pressure, the in initial pressure at the source of the water uh, that the hose is being plugged into will drop by the time it reaches the actual nozzle, just purely off of friction um, of water on the inside of the hose, and you know it loses energy through, I guess, heat rubbing up against the inside of the hose, and um, typically the same process happens with circuits. The more you have voltage drops across long lengths of wire, and, uh, let's see, where is it, I saw little resistors here, okay, these are more modern resistors, <laughs> not modern, but these look more like something you would get in a slightly more sophisticated kit, or, uh, on a circuit board, these are resistors here, um, can you guys see? We have 5 ohms. Resistance is measured in ohms. Current in amps. Volts in volts. 5 ohms, 10 ohms, 15. And this one. Maybe this is a... Uh, it's not labeled here because it's meant to be measured or experimentally guessed, I guess. Maybe. This is... Uh, little lengths of wire and yeah heat typically will knock down the um, the energy in the circuit as it goes across more and more wire or I'm not sure what other um, material is used in, in you know more sophisticated resistors but um, 
then you have elements like light bulbs here. which are a very practical use um, of the fact that resistance creates heat. In more traditional uh, incandescent light bulbs, you have a filament that's, uh, you can see here, maybe I'll, uh, I'll just put it, my hand behind it, I guess, so we could see it. A little filament that um, obstructs the the current, and that obstruction that kind of pinches the flow of the energy distributed by the electrons, and um, that bottlenecking of the volts, the potential energy defined by the volts, creates heat, a buildup of energy across that filament, and that heat like all black body radiation eventually if you uh, get a anything hot enough it emits photons and those photons when they're emitted in great enough quantities they become an actual source of light for the human eye to navigate by anyway so <laughs> That's a light bulb for any any people uh, crawling out of a rock right now. I don't know what else we have. We'll find that out in a little bit. Okay. Oh, and here we go. An actual compass. You can see what direction I'm facing right now. So I know that that is north. Maybe maybe there's too much uh, interference from all these magnets right now. There we go. Yeah, maybe that's what's going on. We'll uh, put that aside. I don't think that's going to be too useful for us. Oh, and here's a little hand crank for the, the motor. Okay. Hmm. Alright, so cool. Maybe it's a little loud. I won't do that too much, but uh, yeah, maybe they are going to have an experiment where we create our own electricity. That would be pretty cool. Okay, and we got the bell. Um, yeah, here we go. This is, uh, those are wires wrapped. Some, I guess some metal pinched between there. And uh, when you spin that, that's going to induce a magnetic field. Um, you spin... Well, maybe I'll let the experiment explain, but uh, yeah, it's really cool when you run current through that wire, or you can induce current if you spin it next to this magnet here. That's probably what's going to go on there. By spinning this, you'll induce current in the wire, and uh, you'll be able to generate electricity. So, alright guys, that's a really long breakdown of our inventory here. Let's tap into, let's see what the first experiment is. I'm going to put some of this stuff back here. 
we have a resistor there. Maybe we'll uh We'll keep some of this stuff handy. guys are interested. Okay. First experiment requires a battery, which I didn't grab. Let me go see if I can find one. And uh, because as basic as it is, I think it is really cool to see the bare bones stripped down operation of a light. Something, again, that's so ubiquitous in our daily life we just take for granted. And, um, you know, like anything, history, science, even philosophy and religion, the more you learn about something, the more you grow to appreciate all our, our current position in our current place in history and all the amenities most people enjoy. I'll be right back. Okay, so I got a little padded platform we could do our little experiments on. Got a AA 1.5 volt battery that we're gonna pop into our battery holder. The formerly named battery holder. Not sponsored by Duracell. This little contraption right here, I forget if I already, um, well, it says it right there, doesn't it? If I already showed it, it's the lamp socket. And, um, what we do, believe it or not, is put a lamp in the socket. this little screw this light bulb in here get a little binaural ASMR there so you screw it down until the bottom of the light bulb touches the wire there, the metal, um, and so you're connecting the circuit from one edge, maybe that's too close, to be able to have current flow across that filament, you're connecting it from one edge, which would be the threads around the base, to the other edge here, which would be the bottom of the light bulb. So it goes in here, across 
the filament and then out here across the other threading there and we have our wires let's pull these apart get a black one for the negative end red one for the positive end positive uh, nodes I think it's the uh, right term and this uh, off camera I had to find this out probably could have read it, read the book and it would have told me, but um, it's a pretty nifty little way of connecting the, uh, the wires here. You just pull up the spring, you slide the fork right in there, and tension in the spring holds it in place. So, we're going to do that. We're going to connect this, this end here. And you know what I'm going to do is turn this lamp, this uh, light bulb off, <laughs> over here. I forgot I had two of them on. So we're, we're going to turn uh, both these guys off. We still got one over here, we'll keep that just for some ambient lighting and with any luck we're going to get a little bit of uh, black body radiation we're going to get the filament to heat up oh there we go so as I pop it in here the current is flowing across this filament here. And purely off of the material heating up from the uh, light bulb looks a little bit dirty there. The current is being restricted in the filament material. Let's try to get in focus. The filament material heats up and it gets hot enough to be able to glow. And that's what we know as an incandescent light bulb. And then when we unscrew it to see the See, it goes. Well, I could just manually lift it up, I guess. So, as I lift the lead up from the bottom, it disconnects, opens the circuit. And so the charges are not able to flow through the wire from one end of the battery the other end that is uh, it's attracted to each other because of the 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 net positive on one end of the battery and the net negative charge of the solution whatever the material the alkaline material inside the battery is um, that's just so cool that that is, those are photons being released by the, the electrons, um, getting excited and then dropping back down and releasing photons due to the material heating up because the charge across it. Um, is being restricted by 
about the material as far as I know maybe I'll look that up real quick maybe it's just the actual material there uh, I remember reading that uh, and I think maybe all of us did it's one of those well-known facts that Thomas Edison the inventor of the light bulb went through hundreds if not thousands of materials to be able to finally find the right filament material that wouldn't disintegrate when it overheats but would also give not be so resistive that it wouldn't let current cross because the sweet spot is where you let the current cross but just at a slow enough pace where it it, uh, it keeps the circuit closed because if you put a piece of wood in there or plastic it would just act like a um, a complete obstruction of the current, and so that would effectively be opening, you know, the uh, circuit and stopping all electrical flow, all current. But you need a material that lets the current go through, so it keeps the circuit closed, but restricts it enough that there creates a buildup or a bottleneck, a resistance that uh, that allows a buildup of heat. So that's um. easiest way to show that a circuit um, you know show what the battery actually does let's see does it, okay there we go so I'll just remove this and if we do a more direct approach we put this end of the battery right down here on that metal strip and so that is effectively connecting the bottom of the battery here with the bottom of the light bulb there and then we connect the top directly to the battery and we get a nice small light source and if we wanted to have a flickering effect to simulate a candle you move it around and you would just um, somehow design a circuit that has a variable resistance to it which I keep talking about that so let's let's connect that just to show you guys that uh, this is uh, affects just it affects just how much current is going to be traveling across these leads right here. So let's see how does this work. So I guess let's pop this back on. Okay, so I just connect this. Tuck that away there. We connect the screw the leads tight. Connect it on that end. and just leave that over there okay so so if we this is a 20 ohm resistor Wait a minute. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody who knows what's going on is laughing at me. The um, if I connect them straight across, this is just going to bypass this because there is a principle that always holds true that uh, just like the flow of water, or <laughs> human beings, um, current always takes the path of least resistance. And so it's not going to go out of its way to travel along any length of wire that it doesn't have to. It's going to take the shortest, most efficient route to uh, close the circuit and get to the source, you know, the other end of the battery that it's attracted to. So when it does that, it is, we got to connect it here on this end and force it by connecting it, not here, but here. Force it through the resistor. And again, we can vary the resistor. The, uh, the resistance, the resistance is what we're varying there. So, unscrew that. Let me turn this light back on. Screw it back in. And now it has to go through this pole, down this clamp, and through any length of wire that I want it to. And um, if I put it all the way over here, it's going to go right through this straight shot. And the reason this creates more variability or, or resistance because this is like a length of wire like this but it's wound up so it's effectively a really long length of wire in a very small uh, you know physical distance it's just wrapped up but the and, and I think well, yeah, just like because I just thought of like why doesn't it just leap linearly across, even if the wire is wrapped up? But I don't know. Maybe the wire has a plastic coating on it, or maybe it just doesn't have a tendency to when it's wrapped up that much. Um, it just can't bypass all that extra wire for some reason. Not sure why, but it goes straight across there because that's just one you know, inch and a quarter length of metal or wire. It goes down here, and it just only, when it's here, it only has to cross that small, small length. So it's minimal resistance, and then here would be maximal resistance. That's not the greatest sound. All right, so let's check it out. And... We're going to connect. So we're going to disconnect this piece over here. And what I'm going to do is put the uh, battery along the strip so it's directly connected to the bottom of the light bulb and then we're going to disconnect this piece instead of also being run along that strip we're going to put it to the top of the battery and force the current to go from the top of the battery through the potentiometer here and, and encounter whatever resistance we're going to set this up as, whatever we make it. And then it will go through the bottom or um, the threading of the light bulb, cross the filament, and light up. So here we go. All right. So we have power, and... Uh, Make sure you guys can see there. You know, 
maybe I should get this even closer. Let me let me get it. All right, so let's give it a shot. Maybe I'll lay that on its side. I said it's at its minimal resistance right now and if we were to increase it um, if we were to slide this along here that should make the length of coil coiled water wire the current has to go through much longer increases the resistance and ultimately gives less um, voltage less energy to the light bulb so in other words the light bulb the longer the length of wire the current travels across the dimmer the light bulb should be because the less energy it's receiving to be able to light up to uh, heat that element that filament up and there we can see right about halfway probably not showing up on camera but right about there is where I can't really see anymore let me see can I get it directly over here there we go okay so right there you guys can see that if I press down really hard so you know what, let me uh Put the battery in the holder so that's not focusing on my ugly fingers. We'll go ahead and get a new wire. out of the way but I want to show you guys the potentiometer the resistor and how we change it okay so we got an overhead view there and the potentiometer the battery the battery's trying to slide off stop being able to see anything and we're gonna decrease the length of wire right there so it's going through from this end of the battery through this bypassing this length and only going through this length and as I push it over in this direction it's going through less and less wire until it uh, only goes through maybe a couple coils right there and it goes right through there and transmits most of the energy of the battery right across the filament you know what I want to do is try the bigger battery now so let's So we'll get the C battery I have here, and it's a, a 1.5 volt battery too. So it's not, but it's a. It says zinc chloride. So I wonder if that's why it's called C. But um, yeah, I'm just curious if uh, delivers more.
power to the light bulb. Mm, no, it doesn't look any brighter. It should be theoretically more bright, I would imagine. No, it's not <laughs> making a difference. But I want to. Uh, we'll get the other battery holder that has two AA battery slots. And we can try that out. And also, let's see. Where did I put that? I had a 9 volt battery. Oh, here it is. So, so with this 9 volt battery here, maybe this might make a difference. Let's see, does this fit around? No, does it? No. Alright, so I'm going to hold that there. Okay, all right, so I just blinded myself. Um, <laughs> all right, okay, that made a difference. That extra um, seven and a half volts made the difference. I might have blew the bowl, actually. What I'm gonna do here is uh, increase the potentiometer all the way here. So we're gonna increase the resistance so that we uh, we don't so we don't blow blow the bulb. And we're gonna try that. We're gonna try not blowing the bulb. Okay, here we go. There we go. Wow, what a difference! What a difference! So that's a nine volt battery with the potentiometer twenty ohms. The complete. 20 ohms, and then here's the 1.5 volt battery, well that's not going to work, with essentially no ohms, so maybe a half an ohm or something, right there, oh, and then we can see that's full, so this was the 1.5 volt battery with minimal resistance on the potentiometer and the 9 for the 9 volt battery I'm going to increase the potentiometer all the way to the full 20 ohms alright so that's the full uh, so that's the 9 volt battery it's not the full 9 volts because it's got a resistance to it and now we're going to increase or, or um, decrease the length of wire that the current has to travel through and we should notice it getting pretty bright and that is really bright I'm sure the relative brightness is coming through on camera, but um, I can't like, I can't look directly at this bad boy. This thing is putting out some serious light. There we go. So it's an interesting little experiment. The uh, difference between batteries right there and the power output okay so we're, we're gonna keep that little guy handy and we're going to get the the, the two battery holder we're gonna put two AA batteries in here and see what happens there so I would imagine that uh, these are connected internally or maybe I have to connect them okay so we're going to pop it out here put this one 
over here. We'll get some more connecting wires to connect these two. And it should act like a 3 volt battery. So the way batteries work is if you stack them in the series. So if you stack them positive to negative to positive to negative, you it sums the battery's uh, voltage. And then if you put them in parallel where both their positive sides are on the same node and it's completing the circuit, it's just going to uh, it's going to be the same voltage across the circuit, but I think it's going to double the current. So if we have, so let's see, we got this one to that one, and then we'll we'll connect them, connect them in series first. So there we go. So now we have double the voltage. That out of, of course that was out of frame but um, so now with both these batteries in place the the way we connect them is gonna make a difference on how much how much voltage and how much current flows but um, I think really the only practical difference is going to be when we change the voltage based on either stacking the batteries like this. When you have them, these are called in series. Two main circuit um, configurations, I guess, that you learn in circuits 101, series and parallel. When they're in parallel, you have two wires that uh, Essentially, these batteries, they maintain the same voltage. I forget what happens if you uh, have two different size batteries. If this was, you know, the 9 volt, and there was still the 1.5 volt, and you had them parallel. Any nodes, any branches of a circuit that is in parallel with the other branches always has the same volts flowing across it. So... So when you have a circuit, you have a wire coming out of the positive end, that's the negative end, and it goes to our, let's say our resistor, and then it goes right back to the negative end of the battery. The the way of analyzing the circuit is that the uh, the voltage flowing across the resistor is the same here as the voltage of the battery, so 1.5 volts. And then if you add another element, like the light bulb, I forget. I think a variable resistor looks like that, with the arrow, arrow through it. Um, you know what, honestly, I forget what the light bulb symbol is. I'm just going to put some light around it. So if we have a light bulb in this, and they're both connected to the same, um, if the battery was coming straight to the variable resistor, and instead of having to go through it before it hits the light bulb, like in, this configuration, I think a light bulb might just be resistor, uh, the resistor symbol. 
so our current configuration is the is the um, series so these are in series and these are in parallel because they're both receiving the same voltage across these um, here because the light bulb isn't directly connected to the battery the current has to drop across this potentiometer here and depending on whether we have it set to 20 ohms or it could go all the way down to essentially zero ohms um, that's going to depend that's going to dictate how much voltage is able to go travel across the light bulb and it's going to increase the brightness here whatever the resistance is set to it's not going to affect the voltage delivered to the um, light bulb but it will impact the I guess perceived resistance of the total circuit that is uh, so it will affect the current anytime you have a little split a fork in the road you have a, a current coming in so that's I sub naught and then here you would say there's a you know, I sub 1 and then the current splits off to go to the light bulb and it splits off to go to this variable resistor you might say that's I sub 2 or vice versa and uh, these currents always the, the forked currents always have to add up to be the initial input current whatever current inputs I mean whatever the current uh, begins as it has to be conserved so the amount of current in I1 or the values of I1 or I2 the amount of current flowing through either of these elements is going to depend on the resistance of one or the other if you have this set to the maximal resistance it will increase the flow of uh, current to this resistance because you have the voltage the total voltage is always going to be the current times the resistance and in any subsection that applies to the entire circuit and it imply, applies to the subsection of the circuit so when you have parallel circuits where they're both receiving the same input voltage it's 1.5 here and here so if you have 1.5 volts traveling across both of these elements but the amount of current will vary depending on the resistance to maintain this side of the equation to be constant the left side the right side is going to have to fluctuate in values depending on what the other variable is doing so as the resistance increases the current will decrease and vice versa this drops nearly to zero this will increase to maintain the same final value but here when you have series circuits the voltage 1.5 volts across this battery here it's 1.5 at the top and the entire 1.5 volts is across both of these elements so it's the combined resistance the current um, that's going to dictate the current so you'll have different values for the current on each of these branches but you'll have the same value of the current going across the uh, the whole this whole branch right here because there's only one branch and it has the same um, so I not here equals the I not down here the current in equals the current out because the uh, regardless 
of the variability of this resistance. The volt is the same. So the, the total voltage from the beginning, if we consider this a series of elements, just as a single unit, the total voltage going through these elements is going to be 1.5. But within the elements, as you try to uh, analyze them separately, like up here, in parallel circuits, you'll have different different current values, depending on the resistances. But because there's only one path here, where there's two paths up here, you could have different values of current flowing, because one, whatever the least resistance is, whichever path up here has the least resistance is going to be the path that most of the current takes. Here, when you have the least resistance, it still has to flow through that path. So instead of this equation being important, um, like it is up here in the parallel circuit, uh, when you arrange it so that you solve for the current instead, that just means that it's a ratio now of the voltage. For each element, the volts across each element will vary but they will add up to the total voltage in the circuit so here in the parallel circuits the resistances might vary and therefore the current is going to vary but as the resistances vary in a single branch circuit it's the voltage across each element that's going to vary to maintain this constant ratio constant current ratio so these the v in each individual element is different so that's v1 and v2 for here it's different from the total v you know v not the initial v of the uh, the big v of the circuit the total circuit here so um the batteries, so when you're talking about putting batteries themselves, so we were just talking about the elements of the circuit, each of these is, you know, just generally, generically called an element. When you're talking about the batteries themselves in the orientation, the, um, you can consider these, difficult to get out of the battery holder, right? also, but uh, either in series or parallel too. So if I were to, you know, connect this like that, because the batteries themselves are the source of volts, of the voltage, the volts will add up when you put them in series like this, so that it has to go all the way, and I'm not sure the actual mechanism of the, n n where is it, the negative end, <laughs> I guess it doesn't show it, but where the negative end touches the positive end of a different battery, but it does sum um, the individual voltages, which is going to mean that now we have three volts, each of these are 1.5, and so you should have correspondingly more current going through the circuit. And uh, we'll put them next to each other so they look like they're parallel. But if we connect this end so that the current flows through... And honestly, I'm not sure if it matters which order, which comes first. You know, which, which end is closer to the positive end of the, uh, the batteries here. So whether it's the potentiometer, the resistance, or the light bulb, I'm not sure it matters because they're in, um, they are, these two are in series. The current flows through one branch only. 
this only has an end connected to the negative. It doesn't have an end connected to the positive directly. It has to flow through the light bulb. And likewise, the, bat uh, the light bulb is only connected to a positive end. It has to flow through the resistor, the potentiometer here, to get to the negative end of the battery. So if we put these another wire here, so that I make a direct connection, so it goes positive to negative, and the negative goes to the positive, it creates one big battery um, of the second battery there. The light bulb should now be getting twice the current, so be, it should be a lot brighter. So we'll put this all the way down. Remember to get the light bulb in the frame. And so we can see, connected in series, the same current is flowing through all of these. But if the 3 volts has to maintain the same uh, value, the batteries are supplying until they run out at least 3 volts to the system. The same current is flowing through both of these elements here. But as I, uh, as I increase the resistance across this one, the voltage is going to vary. So, um, if you can see the light gets dimmer and dimmer. What's going on there is that the resistance is increasing for this element here. I think, okay, I think I had, it's been a long time since I looked at this stuff, and I think I had it wrong, so the best way to anchor your perspective on these is that the, the battery voltage will not change, given that it's a charged battery. Um, the current is the thing that will change. Even though on a series circuit, you... Each element feels in, in a series, being daisy chained together, being on the same single branch, will have the same exact current going through it. That total current, whatever that value is, will itself change based on the individual resistance values. So you find essentially in circuit analysis, you add up each element's resistance and you find the total resistance felt experienced in that series of elements so as we have a minimal value for our potentiometer here if it's all the way over here the total resistance of all the elements because the light bulb's resistance isn't going to change it's it's uh, constant is going to decrease and according to this equation if V is constant 1.5 or now 3 with our two batteries added up um, so we can do this then as the resistance minimizes the current is going to increase so now you have more current flowing through the light bulb making it brighter that's an additional 1.5 when these are together like that they add up to equal 3 volts so you have a total of 3 volts now across all the elements that's not going to change and for this number 3 to stay in the same as you increase the value um, of the potentiometer you have a smaller and smaller current flowing through both elements as you decrease it you have a total decrease in resistance and therefore a larger and larger current 
And so when you see a spark, if I were to connect, disconnect this wire and touch it right there, there might actually be a little spark. So maybe we'll try that because you have minimal resistance and you just have a burst. Uh, you have a short circuit. That's a burst because there's minimal, the elements are shorted and current takes the path of least resistance and um, it flows it essentially has no nothing re to resist its full flow from one end of the battery to the other and in really large batteries like car batteries it's a it can be a massive spark and so here if we were to pop this off and touch it right here Yeah, there's a small, small spark right there. It's probably not good to do that too long. We'll probably burn the battery out. But um, if I were to do it with a 9-volt battery, which, you know what? What the heck? Let's try it out. That might be a much, much larger spark. So if I just go right across, let's see what happens. I don't want to test it too much here. I'm not going to play with fire too much, but yeah, there was a small spark. I don't, I don't think it really showed up on the camera there. Um, okay, so what else can we do with this? Turn the lights back on and look at the book. I like the little sentiment here too. I didn't uh, notice it. I didn't read it earlier. <laughs> which uh, clearly I need to sharpen my powers of observation. Uh, it says practical experiments in physics are not just motivational and fun. They can also sharpen students' powers of observing and questioning and are key to enhanced learning. So we have our series in parallel and we kind of already did that. And we have, and you know, as you get more and more complex circuits, the schematics of circuits for our phones, for instance, have billions, literally billions of nodes and branches. So uh, it's very difficult. Well, it's impossible to ever draw that out, but... Um, we actually have computer programs that 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 dictate what the simplest or most uh, efficient circuit would look like to be able to complete what to be able to yield the input that the uh, electrical engineers desire. There we can see the schematic of a light bulb. You have a foot contact at the bottom. So one end is going to the threads. The centerpiece is insulation. You have gas in here and a tungsten filament. So I guess that the, uh, the heat doesn't cause any burning up of you know, regular atmosphere inside, so it's a inert gas or a vacuum sometimes. You know, let me give my little handy dandy uh, my book pad here. So we have the in 
I just noticed this. Here's the light bulb, the symbol for light bulb that I uh, didn't remember. And then we have ammeters that measure the current flowing through a circuit, which we can do. And we could see how it, uh, as you increase the resistance, the total current flowing through a circuit is going to decrease. Or did I say that right? Increases with a decrease in resistance. Resistance is that's a useful uh, diagram here. Resistance is a hindrance of the movement of currents. So the voltage is always applying the same force, and the amount of resistance is how tight that bottleneck is going to be, and therefore it increases or decreases the flow. So a lot of these are basic, just getting us set up and used to the idea here of uh, how to connect a basic circuit and let current start flowing. And now we have the the introduction of a, a motor into our system here. And the potentiometer you see here, that's a, a good symbol there. It shows you that you know this arrow can point over here and make the make use of the entire resistance in the potentiometer. You can put it all the way down here and essentially make it non-existent. Here's the equations if you want to learn it. It's really nice because the first few weeks of, um, or even months, no, weeks, I guess, of circuit analysis is fairly straightforward. You just either add up the resistances or you add up the... Uh, across a series, or you subtract the voltages across a series, or you split up the currents at a different, at a particular node. Yeah, so here, same current flows through each series circuit. So here, um, circuit analysis on a basic level before you get to alternating current, because um, all batteries are just direct current, the voltage is constant. Alternating current has a sinusoidal, uh, sinusoidal variation in the amount of voltage. It goes from positive to negative and varies in a um, in a predictable way in which the current also oscillates as the voltage changes and uh, when you start to introduce capacitors which get charged up and dissipate at a predictable rate and then you have other uh, what's called uh, active elements that react to changing voltage or current um, that introduces a whole a whole new complexity into the analysis of it but for here when you have just simple uh, a battery and a switch and some 
other elements there. You analyze the circuit simply by just reducing it into its simplest algebraic configuration. If you had a circuit that looks like this, you would reduce these resistors until they looked like, um, until you understood the equivalent resistance that that created from the point of view of the battery. When you close that switch, the battery is going to create a, uh, the resistance felt by the voltage given off by that battery is going to determine what current runs through this entire branch right here. So here's a way to, yeah, you have an unknown current. So you can tell based on your equations, you can essentially solve for an unknown variable. And then we get into magnetism. You know what I want to do? I want to just mess around with the motors a little bit more. And uh, we'll make magnetism the second video in our electromagnetic kit series. And that'll be kind of fun. Look at that. You can make an electromagnet by winding wire around the battery. So when you do that and you apply voltage across it, you will create a magnetic field. created from the chemical combustion of gas, gasoline, it rotates the engine, and uh, you are rotating coiled up wires next to a magnet, and as you do that, you're inducing a current, so as it passes this uh, magnet creates a static magnetic, well, the magnet is a static magnetic field. It has one around it. And as you rotate these wires around it, the, the movement of those wires through different parts of the magnetic field and different strengths of that magnetic field induces a current in the wires that, um, and that's the basis of uh, how we can get electricity and a big rotating cylinders of coiled up wire. How uh, power plants, whether they're the power is derived from burning coal or whether it's by having a mediated fission reaction of uranium cores, by uh, by inducing a a subcritical chain reaction in uranium uh, pellets, a couple tons of them, you can um, derive energy to give, you know, the community, residential or whatever, um, to, to put into the power lines from which we all plug into at our houses or other locations we inhabit, um, simply by the, this same principle right here. 
whether it's coal or uranium supplying the initial energy, the same mechanism roughly is always that that coal or uranium is used to heat water or heat up some medium that in turn is essentially just a really, really, really highly advanced steam engine. We use steam to rotate, mechanically rotate, big, giant magnets to induce electricity. And, uh, be able to talk to myself on a phone like I'm doing right now so let's see what uh, let's see what else we have here well Let's see if I can do that. Let's see, can we power the light bulb? So we got the hand crank, the little motor right here. So I wonder if I, uh, if I connect this here, if we can slow or quicken the speed of the fan using the potentiometer. So we have So we have our fan right here, and uh, all we need to do is we have the battery connected, connect the positive in here, and it's going to run the 3 volts. Right now we have the potentiometer set to 0. And our little fan should spin with a little bit of energy decrease it so it's less so it's more current less resistance the more resistance we put through the potentiometer the less current is able to flow through the entire circuit so
just had to look up exactly how motors work. There's many different types of motors, electric motors, but um, this one right here is a simple type that is essentially looks like this, where once you have current run through the wires, the um, it can be three pole like this or two pole. I'm sure there's more designs, but um, this thing is housed in a stator, which is a static set of two magnets, one south, one north, one would be over here, and as you induce the current through it, or as you run current through it, that current wrapping around the wires induces its own magnetic field, which reacts to the magnetic field created by the magnets in, uh, in which it's housed. And an interesting feature that I just read about, when you have a two pole, so there's two wires inside, and I'll put up a uh, picture of what I'm talking about right here. You can see that the repulsive force that spins, that allows the spinning to happen, is it only applies when the magnets are in certain positions that uh, in which you have a you know positive or like charges uh, next to each other and it's going to repel it or propel it I don't know what the word is but if you happen to have the commuters I think it's called the spinning part um, set up so that it's perfectly at a position where there's zero torque. So at a position that's kind of like opposite in the position it's it wants to stay in. Then the so if you have like a you know, if this was a positive side of a magnet facing a negative side of the magnetic field uh, induced by the electric current, then the two would want to stay right there. There would be no repulsive force. Be a negative and a positive, they would attract. But if you tweak it just a little bit, then there's that initial, initial momentum. And apparently they work <laughs> by momentum. So as long as it has enough momentum to get through that little phase where there's zero torque. It kind of just pushes right past that and then the rest of the rotation is a is one that injects momentum where the like charges are close enough where they continue spinning um, between the uh, like charges between the internal rotating uh, commuter and the stator the static housing, the magnetic, static magnetic housing that has a static magnetic field in which this separate induced magnetic field created from the wires is uh, rotating. So it's essentially just electric motors work by having two varying, two or more maybe, varying magnetic fields that... Uh, that uh, rotate with respect to each other, creating a constant force. And I think this one, so I unhooked it and hooked it back up with the, the ma uh, potentiometer fully engaged, so it's running through the full length of the wire here. And I think it, it might either be in that undesirable position inside where the, the coils are next to the part of the stator housing magnets that they are attracted to, so there's no torque. And therefore the internal cylinder, the, um, what do you call it, the axle, the main the shaft, I guess. I don't know why I forgot that word. Um, so we have it hooked up here. So we have power going to it. 
and we should see the motor spin when it has power going to it but it doesn't want to so uh, I was gonna try to manually rotate it past the position of minimal torque and see if that does anything and there it goes so that's interesting that sometimes one of the downfalls of these simple motors is that it can be stopped in that position and uh, so it won't have any initial uh, you know initial initiating torque to uh, get the initial momentum spinning and uh, there again it needs a little a little push I wonder if the same thing is going to happen with uh, if I were to decrease the resistance so increasing the current through the whole circuit here that the motor also is going to receive yeah yeah it doesn't have that issue so maybe it was just a you know a lack of enough current to have just get the initial maybe overcome the um, the mass the actual momentum uh, what would we call that the uh, you know the friction of the actual mass or maybe it was the position of the is it the commuter or the actuator armature armature the shaft I don't know I'm trying to figure out what it is but uh, you can see it's trying there oh there we go so oh so I think that might be it so sometimes you're in a position where there's no torque even when you apply power to it so that's definitely a downfall which I'm sure they have you know um, sophisticated more complex motors they have uh, maybe secondary motors that turn in the event that uh, this one you don't have that initial favorable position. Interesting. All right, guys, I'm going to pack it up here and uh, we'll mess around more with magnets next time. Thanks again to all my Patreon supporters and everybody out there who comments, likes, um, and uh, shows love to the channel. You guys are awesome and you really keep me going. You keep me encouraged. So, thanks for all the love. I'll see you next time.